welcome everybody to this um, Durham Energy Institute COP26 um, workshop uh, seminar. <laughs> it's the fifth in a series and we'll be um, continuing the series after the summer holidays. Uh, and I'm delighted to welcome four guest speakers today. I, I'm afraid I'll have to give apologies on behalf of Andres Lucreala. Uh, unfortunately, he's, um, he's not been able to make it today for unavoidable reasons. But we will continue. We have a very eminent uh, panel of speakers today. And our topic is the just transition. I'm sure most of you are aware that um, in the early approach to thinking about how to deal with climate change, the emphasis was very much on um, changing the technologies that uh, produced greenhouse gas emissions, but it fairly quickly became apparent that it's not just a question of changing technology, we're also changing the way that we do things, the way that people operate, and that there are very serious issues around justice and fairness and so forth that need to be included. And this has been very much more uh, explicit in recent versions of things like the Paris Agreement, the European Union's um, green agenda and so forth. So what we want to do today is um, look at some different perspectives on the just transition. It's not comprehensive, there are very many perspectives, but we have some great speakers today to help us think about this. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to remind you that the uh, UK Universities Network has produced a briefing paper on the just transition, and there is a background paper also in progress. Uh, I'm sure that by the end of today's session, we'll have reference to a lot of other publications that would help you and we maybe will collect some of those into a, uh, an information sheet for you later on. So what we'll do is that each of the speakers will be invited to give a five minute intervention. And then we'll um, take um, questions and we'll open it up to discussion. So um, I think we'll take all the speakers first and then uh, the discussion. So if you have questions along the way, please do write them straight into the chat uh, and then we can take them afterwards all together. So um, I know that you've all had information about the speakers, so I'm not going to give you a detailed background, um, but I will introduce each in turn. So first of all, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Raphael Heffron, who's a Professor for Global Energy Law and Sustainability at the Centre for Energy, Petroleum and Mineral Law and Policy at the University of Dundee. Raphael, over to you. Thank you. And it's a pleasure to speak to you today. And I, I would just highlight in terms of all the work going on in terms of the Just Transition, that I'm also a EU German Aid Professor in the Just Transition itself. And also the British Academy has uh, numerous grants on the Just Transition announced a couple of months ago, and I think most of those are aiming to deliver for around COP uh, later this year, so lots of research to watch out for. Just my own view in terms of thinking about the Just Transition, I come from the perspective where I see the Just Transition about being inclusive, inclusiveness, equality, equity, sustainability, you hear all these words talked about, but really we're talking about you know, different elements of justice. So distributive justice, procedural, restorative, recognition and cosmopolitan. And I would stress the cosmopolitan justice element just because that makes the big connection to the Paris Agreement. But also from my own view, when we think about these five forms of justice, I come from, let's say, a more law and policy background. And as such, I'm one who believes that we are, we are facing a climate emergency. Therefore, there's a priority that we need to have action. This action needs to happen in a top-down way. I'm not saying bottom-up action can't happen, but I mean, because of the climate emergency, we actually need a lot of top-down uh, policy approaches or we're never going to keep within that 1.5 to 2 degree temperature rise. So that's why it's been exciting to see some initiatives by different governments around the world including up here in Scotland, where we had the Just Transition Commission. So we had some exciting announcements and exciting reports from them. It remains to be seen what the Scottish government will do afterwards. 
they have allocated money to do, you know to different places such as Aberdeen to try and help that transition but let's say uh you know the the termly report card is uh, we still can't fully fill it in for the Scottish government but let's see what they announce until uh COP26 later this year and I'll just finish off on another point um in terms of my own research in terms of looking at legal decisions around the world and I just wanted to highlight a deci legal decision in two 2019 in Australia known as the Gloucester Resources case and that case highlighted how Australia refused the opening of a coal mine because they did not want to be responsible for that carbon dioxide being burnt in another country so that's very much thinking about beyond the border beyond you know thinking about business supply chains where that coal is going where it's going to be used and that's why we say uh, you know this rise in cosmopolitan justice where people believe that they are citizens of the world we have obligations in what we do in our own countries and i think we already see this in terms of big business and the sort of impact the the demand of society looking at issues around consumption and inter, you know these big multinational companies so anyway that's just an element of my approach to the just transition and a final point to say that it's all aiming to ensure that we have this low carbon economy developed within our societies and that this happens in a just way so thank you thank you Rafa. that's an excellent start our next speaker is Dr. Kirsten Jenkins, who's an early career lecturer in energy, environment and society within the Science, Technology and Innovation Studies Group at the School of Social and Political Sciences at the University of Edinburgh. That was a mouthful, Kirsten. I'm very pleased to say she's also um, a, a fellow of the DEI and part of our team who are um, engaging with the Norwegian Include Research Centre for Socially Inclusive Energy Transitions. Kirsten, over to you. Thank you very much. It's definitely a, uh, a mouthful, that one. Um, I am having mic problems today, so if anyone can't hear me, I'd appreciate some kind of jazz hand uh, manoeuvre so that you can make me aware. <laughs> um, I have to say in a number of ways that I uh, agree with Raphael. Uh, we don't always. We have some good banter in the literature, um, but that I would also draw some points of distinction. So my uh, background to start with and my PhD thesis looked at energy justice uh, and the language of that in particular and applied that to uh, the energy transitions issue. And that has its own particular formula and structure and that looks a lot like what Raphael was describing in terms of distribution procedure recognition, cosmopolitanism, etc. Um, and really, it does represent that attempt to humanize these transitions, to make sure that we're using this language of sustainability and recognizing that equity, justice, inclusion and fairness is part of that, um, albeit one that's often sidelined. But for me, and this is a tension that I see emerging, the just transition means something slightly different. So myself and a few others are currently funded by climate strategies, uh, for example, to do some work around the oil and gas transition in the UK and to do some international comparative work with uh, Denmark and Norway. And where we're using just transitions in that context, it's more specifically related to labour unions, labour forces, uh, fossil fuel industries and a lot to do with EU policy making, uh, national and regional interpretations of that as well. And that to me, as I say, represents a slightly different faction. You have energy justice on the one hand, which is perhaps this broader conceptualization, which can cover things from mining all the way through to energy poverty um, at the consumption end. Whereas just transition for me is very much distinctly labor union oriented and fossil fuel oriented. And so what I'm bringing to this discussion is perhaps a desire for clarity around that language um, or an openness to the fact that, you know, diluting the two might also open up um, possibilities. And that's something that we touched upon in our um, COP26 network paper to some extent. And it's also something that we open up in the longer piece as to how these two ambitions can reconcile. I'm also particularly interested going forward, not just in conceptualizing this um, from behind a rather lovely desk or 
thinking about the different tenants that might be part of it, but really looking at the legal and regulatory frameworks by which we can actually enact this in practice, looking at the roles of unions, looking at the roles of labour law, um, and so on and so forth, to say beyond normative ambition, what practical action might look like. So that's my start. <laughs> Fabulous. Thank you very much. That's really an excellent uh, step forward. Um, Sarah Knuth, Dr. Sarah Knuth, is an assistant professor in the Department of Geography at Durham University. Uh, and Sarah, over to you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Um, uh, yeah, so this thanks thanks so much for the opportunity to participate in this because it's it's already been really interesting. Um, and and I would say I think I think the other speakers are are very right here that when we're talking about just transitions, that this is a necessarily very plural project. Uh, and so when I think about it, I, I definitely think about my work, which is I think somewhat narrower, as very much contributing to a broader collective effort that that we have to see proceed on a lot of different levels. Um, so my own work is I'm, I'm a political economist in the Department of Geography at Durham, um, and my work has especially really focused on critical questions of finance and financial geographies. Um, and so how that relates here is that basically, you know, we know we need big investments for decarbonization and climate change adaptation, but there are these big and, and you know, remaining profound questions uh, where that will come from, what will what that will really look like, uh, and who will be empowered to direct it. And so something that you know, I'm especially concerned with in a lot of work on some of the new green investment uh, uh, strategies, and there's been quite a few of them emerging, is the, the urge to learn from past experiences of promised financial innovation, and especially looking at experiences like subprime lending in the late 2000s financial crisis, um, with a real concern for the dangers of certain forms of climate financial innovation that can paradoxically create fresh vulnerabilities for the most at-risk communities across both northern and southern contexts, um, you know, with a real sense that one of academia's jobs, I think, is to provide a watchdog as well as you know, encouraging what is actually good and promising around new financial possibilities. Um, so, you know, some recent work that I've done, for example, is looking at energy efficiency loans in the U.S. context, uh, so PACE loans, if anyone's familiar, which is uh, something I'm looking at in climate frontline states like Florida, and what we're seeing with some of these, you know, otherwise, you know, somewhat promising loans for a difficult practice, which is energy efficiency retrofitting, is that we're seeing problematic practice in marketing that raise some really uncomfortable parallels to subprime lending. So things like racial targeting, unbearable debt loads for, for the poorest, um, exploitation by financial intermediaries. So some things that we really have to pay attention to if we don't want to worsen vulnerability in the end. Um, and so my work, I really see it in, in kind, of two, kind of two strands. And one of them is both critical interventions, so trying to play more of a watchdog role on what isn't working perhaps, um, but also looking at targeted research in support of alternatives. And those might be various State directed Green New Deal or green recovery programs, especially kind of big investment authorities coming in. And that's something that I'm increasingly working to support with activist research. So for example, on investment in public power. So asking questions like, how can alternative forms of investment promote more just practices, but also what uh, practical challenges they're facing. Fabulous, thank you, Sarah. I think it's clear already that we're, we're developing quite a number of different dimensions to this issue. So that's really helpful, thank you. Jess Lyman is also in the uh, Department of Geography at Durham University. Uh, Jess, over to you. Hi, thank you. Um, like everyone else, I think that, uh, you know, the picture that's emerging clearly here is that there are lots of different angles on just transition and that, you know, we need to think of, across many different perspectives. My own kind of piece of the pie, I guess, or my own sort of window into it I think the question I want to ask here is, what does a just transition look like from sites of fossil fuel extraction? So I've been um, really interested in these in various kind of dynamics happening at, at um, sites we might think of as kind of boom towns for oil and gas, especially in the United States um, for almost a decade now. Um, and I think, you know, when I think about questions of energy transition, um, 
and climate change adaptation from these sites, uh, a kind of a couple of things kind of emerge. First of all, I think that these sites are both kind of pressure points and privileged windows into contemporary politi carbon politics. So I think that it's not just about kind of these, a lot of times these places are kind of, you know, they're rural, they're out of the, they're in sort of in the middle of nowhere. People think about them as being these sort of like boom towns have this kind of whole mythology around them, right? We think about them as being kind of strange and remote and over there. But actually I think that there are places where the kind of um, tensions between um, the, the kind of necessity of energy transition and the difficulty of breaking um, our kind of addiction to fossil fuels, these kind of, these hard edges really come up. Um, and I think that there are also sites where we can see interesting potentials for change even beyond thinking about jobs. Um, so I think that, you know, these are really important sites to think from, but they're also really heterogeneous. So not only are different sites where fossil fuels are extracted really different from each other um, around the world um, or even within um, individual countries. They have different histories. Um, they have different kind of physical conditions, um, different economic, different regulatory frameworks, all of this. Um, but also within the sites, people experience, um, the, they, people have different relations to the fossil fuel industries. People experience climate change differently. Um, these sites are, are really heterogeneous. Um, and I think even for individuals in these sites, uh, people have, um, in my experience, oftentimes really ambivalent relations with fossil fuels, with the fossil fuel industry. So, um, you know, I think it's, you know, we, we would be doing them a disservice to kind of think about these sites as all kind of like boosters for um, the fossil fuel industry. And then of course they aren't just experiencing energy transition or energy extraction, they're also experiencing climate change, they're also experiencing the effects of the pandemic. Um, and so, you know, lots of things are happening um, at these sites that make them really complex places to think from. Um, so, you know, these are all, all kind of complicating factors and I think asking this question of what does a just transition look like from these sites? And I think they also point to the necessity of thinking about jobs, of course, and about I think some of the, you know, labor questions that Kirsten was bringing up are really central here, um, but also thinking kind of beyond jobs. So thinking about things like climate change adaptation, thinking about um, relations with fossil fuel companies, um, thinking about the cultural politics of energy, um, and thinking about social reproduction and how all of these, um, you know, different kind of dimensions uh, come to shape what a just transition could look like um, in these places. I'll stop there. Thank you very much indeed. So we have a number of um, perspectives, both from different professional or, or disciplinary points of view, and also from different locations within uh, our energy world. So. Um, I would welcome questions or comments from participants. You can um, write it into the chat or uh, raise your hand if you like. Um, and maybe while we wait, uh, I'm just wondering, and there might be people here who would like us to have a go at defining what a just transition could be. Uh, if so, let us know, otherwise we won't <laughs> do it. But if you'd like us to, then, then please do ask. Uh, that's a good uh, good way of trying to grapple with some of the uh, the tricky questions. Um, and I was wondering if, if any of our speakers would like to link their or, or compare their approach to other speakers, because clearly, uh, you know, regulation and finance are two incredibly important levers for for managing change. So yeah, Rafael, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, um, I, I think maybe in, in maybe in to stimulate debate, but in response to some of the other uh, speakers, let's say, I, I often think that there's people trying to uh, narrow the focus of a just transition, you know, it, that it's all about the jobs or the oil and gas sector, but, you know, really the just transition is has moved on from just a jobs focus and i've i've spoken to people who have worked in jobs and they you know they agree the just transition is is there for all and i think we we have to remember that the real common goal here is a transition to a low carbon economy 
And I think singling out, you know, a specific industry is holding us back because what we want is a lot of public support. Um, and we even think about something like mining, you know, whether you're mining for coal, oil and gas, you know, we also mine for critical minerals where we need those for the for the the transition. So it's about thinking about how those people in the critical min industry how they'll be part of this just transition as well, how the renewable energy sector people will be as well, because we can't place all our hope on the old fossil fuels because, you know, they're not going to be potentially around later on. You know, this, this is a society wide movement. And that's why I would advocate that we have to have a convergence of ideas and we have to make sure that the public are all on board and no one is left behind. So the, the days of narrow focuses should be should be over. Thank you. Um, Sarah and Kirsten have both raised their hands and, and, and I'm gonna add to that charge with another question, which is that, um, you know, the current energy system is not just. Why do we think we're gonna achieve justice through the transition? Very well, that's a challenge for you, <laughs> Sarah first. Uh, mainly to agree with both of you, actually. I mean, I think it is, it's, it is just, it's critical to, to kind of everything we're doing, especially in the last few years. I think we've seen a real turning point in some, you know, some of these renewable energy industries in terms of, you know, the kind of ways that the industry is consolidating in different places, places around things um, like land justice and the kind of monopolization of specific energy systems by new actors um, and also practices in you know the kind of opening up of new frontiers for critical resources so some of the, my work on lithium in nevada um, you know it's we're dealing with something where there's a lot of money pouring in on, on the kind of money and and i don't think that it's inevitable that this has to happen in an unjust way or there are greater or lesser degrees of injustice in large scale land transformation and new extraction geographies, but it is, you know, an area where we really need politics on the ground. Um, and I think there is this kind of, we get our, we get backed into a corner, I think, too often on some of the things that we all agree with, you know, like the urgency of reorganization for a low carbon transition and forced to think about, you know, that there is no alternative to be to the kind of lowest common denominator way of that happening. Um, and so trying to hold both, both of these kind of conflicting ideas in our head at the same time, I think is one of the most difficult intellectual and political challenges we're facing. Thank you. Kirsten, I wonder if in making your comments, you could also uh, respond to Jeff Moore's question about um, which theory or theories of justice are being used and whether there's any convergence? Thanks. I can give it a go. Um, I don't know how I managed to put up the palest hand emoji, but it's no representation of my pasty white skin tone. Um, yeah, I, again, disagree to some extent. What I will say is I am a pedant and a semantic person. And what I would say here is we're talking about two slightly different things. One is a just energy transition and one is a just transition. And a just energy transition, I completely agree with the previous two speakers, um, is this broader notion of a normative goal in a low carbon transition. And that is one that is collective. It represents all of these different facets of the energy system, all of the stakeholders embodied in it and so on and so forth. But to go back to my earlier point, the just transition is then something slightly different. And I think it's something that's worth protecting. It uh, comes with a particular focus, as Raphael says, around fossil fuels um, and labor organizations. It's pinned in particular language in the Paris Agreement. It's in the International Labor Organization principles and so on and so forth. And so that still has political power. It still has um, a strong social apparatus. And whilst it is narrowing down one area of focus, I see that more as a positive thing because it's a recognitional aspect that those groups are deserving of a particular type of justice in this setting and that they are being accounted for in part particular political systems. And so I want to keep on saying that it's not that I think you know one isn't important and the other is i think they both exist and i think they can exist in harmony but i don't want to get to a position where we just go Bleh, and they all become one um 
I would also say, and this is something that you said, Simone, that, you know, when we're talking about the transition, there isn't a transition. There are lots of little transitions echoing throughout here. We have um, electrification of vehicles, we have the transition towards smart homes, we have the death of oil and gas. I think we would all sign that one off as a death. Um, and these things are happening in a, a non-sequential and quite messy way. And there's good and there's bad to that. There's opportunities and there's fails. And perhaps what we can say above all is that justice as a piece of language and as a set of concerns needs to be there. And we can learn lessons from each of those different sectors as they evolve. In terms of um, Jeff's question around, therefore, what a just transition means, um, and I like Simone's challenge that could be about a 42 day long uh, webinar, I think, as we try to find these things. Um, I would never say personally that it would be a goal center definition. I would struggle with the notion that we say it's fair, sustainable energy for all. Um, but I would put it in terms of a principal definition where we're looking at things like distributional justice, justice as recognition um, and procedural justice and applying those in contexts so that the context in which they are used um, retain some flexibility on how they're interpreted, which weighting they give to different criteria. Um, and that is a definition which to me stems from climate justice, environmental justice and energy justice, and again is fairly distinct from um, international labour organisation principles of the just transition for fossil fuel workers. So there are different theoretical approaches um, that are sitting at this messy intersection. Thank you. I, I'd certainly add to that, that that in the ethics field, in, in, in philosophy, there's a broad discussion also ongoing around what justice and fairness might mean and how they relate to one another. Um, but let's let's move on to the next question um, from Richard Harper. Would any of you like to leap in and respond to this question? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a quick go. Um, I think Richard's question is very good because um, I, I will look I will look forward to reading uh, Kirsten's research because on one hand she's saying that um, we shouldn't have a goal oriented policy and then on the other hand she's saying we have to we should have distributive uh, procedural and recognition but by their nature distributive procedural and recognition are goal oriented. So if I want distributive justice, I'm thinking about, yes, I want more fairness, I want more equality, I want more inclusiveness across, you know, how people pay for electricity, how they pay for energy, energy access across the world, distribution of, uh, you know, the, the good and bad of CO2 emissions, generally the bad. So if, if I was to answer Richard's question, I would say, Yes, yeah, sometimes people do use justice as a distraction because ultimately we live in a world where we're seeking the Paris Agreement. We're, you know, we're running out of time by all accounts because we haven't invested enough in new clean energy infrastructure all across the world. So I would agree that we need to balance the needs. And, you know, maybe I will go back to Kirsten's point that despite not trying to define the just transition, she did say for her what it meant was climate justice, environmental justice and energy justice scholars coming together. You know, I couldn't agree more convergence, as I said before, and that's where we need to be thinking all these scholars coming together to say we do have an obligation to stay within that 1.5 to 2 degrees as much as we can be talking about different forms of justice we all have a common goal and it's based on science and i think that's why so many researchers are looking at this justice issue thank you sarah um if you wanted to also pick up uh, laura's question that would be excellent about um the kinds of market inefficiencies that are um produced by fossil fuel subsidies and how you can ensure fuel justice without those. Can you see the question, the next one? Uh, you I'm, read, I'm reading it in real time, but um, well, let me do the first one first while I think about the second one. Um, but the, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would say that I, I like the question because it's, it's 
what I think is, for example, really conceptually as well as politically fascinating around projects like a Green New Deal is the kind of the opening up of new imaginaries around things like jobs. And I think why that matters to Richard's question specifically is some of the kind of political fighting around these big programs is about, well, how can you how can you claim that a pro, you know, kind of Medicare for all or 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 you know, job job training policies for teachers, for example, are part of, of decarbonization. And I actually think that, you know, even though that has real political stakes, it's embedded in real political fights about why you would include that or not. I think there's a broader lesson to take in the kind of um, in some of the difficulties I think we can run into around uh, kind of jobs models, for example, that are too zero sum focused on well, a fossil energy lost uh, must be a clean energy job gained. So I think some of these broader ideas of transition and saying, well, there are a lot of different kinds of low carbon jobs that you know, haven't been very well protected, haven't been well paid, but they are socially valuable work. And if we can kind of shake our imaginaries a little bit, we can actually do more with these big investment programs that not only reduces a lot of vulnerability that we're looking at for climate change down the road, but also potentially builds more political support for large scale interventions you know, at the scale we actually do need. So um, let, me, uh, let me pass to Jesse and I'll think about the next question. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think that my, my response maybe comes up to Simone's question, maybe also Richard's question. I think that for me, I think a lot of people who I think are interested in energy for us, it's not just about energy, isn't just about kind of how we heat our homes or fuel our transportation or these kinds of things, right? We believe that energy is about so much more and that our energy systems actually underlie our relationships to kind of what produces our energy also underlies lots of our kind of social structures, right? So our ideas around what freedom is even or what a good life is or what justice looks like all are kind of wrapped up in our relations with these kinds of earthly materials that produce our energy systems. So to me, I think that, you know, you're exactly right that uh, we our current energy system is not just. And so why would we assume that, you know, a future system would or could be just, but I think, you know, maybe similarly to what Sarah was saying, I think that for me, the energy transition is an opportunity to rethink these kind, you know, to think about how these relations um, are going to be different and by, you know, by necessity. Um, and so I think that it's not, for me, there isn't, I think that, you know, it's hard to think about justice in terms of a, a goal that we can say, okay, now we've achieved it, you know, um, but in more towards the kind of orientation that we want to have um, towards these questions. And um, I think that, you know, maybe that doesn't fit so neatly into kind of the different definitions of justice. Um, but I think that recognizing this as, as a moment, as a kind of opportunity to think about, again, beyond the kind of the ways we heat our houses or our transportation or these kinds of the kind of typical questions you think around energy um, to actually think about the kind of our, the broader questions of social organization um, that we might be able to get at. Thank you. Yes, maybe we should put Laura's question in a, in a bigger context, which is that there's you know, a great deal of historical research and other research showing us that the idea of extracting resources from uh, poorer areas has been the driver for colonial expansion over a number of centuries. So the world we're living in today is a reflection of uh, imperial ambitions, first of, of European and then other, other uh, countries in the world. So um, the reason that we can't address that is because it's so inbuilt in the infrastructure of the fossil fuel economy. So a transition is looks like an opportunity to shake that up, right? But of course, it's not going to be let go easily because some people are doing very nicely out of that. So if the um, many of the fossil fuel subsidies are hidden, what happens then when we don't have fossil fuels anymore and those subsidies have to be shaken up again? Who's going to decide where they lie? And how are they going to um, help the poorest rather than the richest? Okay, Sarah. Uh, yeah, I mean, couldn't very well said. <laughs> couldn't have said it better than that. But I mean, I, I think I would just add too that I think, you know, we we are at a point where, um, you know, one of the really exciting things and one of the things that I think creates a lot of opening for all of us and kind of imagining how we do rapid transition more justly is that 
you know, a lot of fossil fuel alternatives are really cheap and increasingly so. And so I think the, the kind of, you know, beyond kind of market inefficiencies, I think the kind of perversities of locking into the wrong energy system, just because it's cheap now, or there's a kind of pressure by, you know, folks who are getting displaced by certain economies, policies into new frontiers, um, there's a real danger in those places investing now and then, um, you know, having those investments really quickly stranded. Um, and that's, you know, a very kind of economistic way of putting it, but that has real social costs. Um, so, I mean, I think there is the, this is why some of the kind of broader questions around COP are going to be so important around development funding and the rethinking of development funding and some of the real, you know, the really profound challenges around making those kinds of investments accessible and affordable. But, you know, the problem is not a technology problem, I would say at this point, maybe electric cars and electric vehicle charging, and I would bow to other experts in the room here. But when we're talking about a lot of the kind of, you know, grid scale technologies or, or distributed energy technologies, it's much more a kind of political and regulatory and investment challenges than a technological one at this point. Okay, thank you. So Kirsten, maybe when you're responding, you could think about um, Mira's question, because Mira is basically asking, when it comes to the transition, should users pay or should the costs be socialized, if you like? Should they be borne by state or by public organizations? I can give it a go. Uh, I'm going to end up talking in a big circle. So if you saw my notes, they just kind of go like this, <laughs> which I think is represents the dynamic of how challenging this all is. Um, I will start by saying Raphael Heffron is a lawyer and what he did was uh, a classic lawyer defense on my, uh, my, <laughs> my words and slightly twisted towards his own evidence. Um, and well, I just want to say that that was probably a misinterpretation of where I was going with them. Um, the distribution procedure recognition, uh, your honor, I hold my hand up, um, because what I'm saying here is that we, whilst we have this guiding framework, it's in its application to particular context that we get these just different justice interpretations and weightings and that we need to, as much as we have overarching frameworks, not guidelines um, or definitions, but overarching frameworks, we need to make sure that they serve the interests of all of the people and context as best that they can. So that we could, for example, go to Kazakhstan and talk about uranium mining, talk about distribution procedure recognition, but come out with perhaps different answers of what justice might look like as if we did that in uh, the north of Scotland talking about electrification of vehicles. And that I think is a really powerful um, guiding aim of what we should be looking to achieve through these conversations is talking about those frameworks and overarching goals, but maintaining that contextual sensitivity and that I think sits really well with what Jessica was saying that a lot of this isn't just about energy therefore it's about cultural embeddedness, lived histories, um, social settings, social interactions and even what it is to be a definition of a person um, in a fossil fuel community, your worker, your generation, your a legacy perhaps. And all of that makes it extremely, extremely hard to negotiate, but all the more important to have these um, kind of conversations. And I think if we were to unpack those conversations across those multiple contexts, this is already coming through our discussion, but what is uniting us here is this notion perhaps of structural inequality, that whilst it's being manifested through energy concerns, there are deeper things wrong in society. Um, and that one of the ways perhaps of correcting that, which I know absolutely fluff all about because I'm not intelligent enough, is through economic um, modelling, financing, <laughs> um, and so on and so forth. So the, the question of um, where taxation comes into this isn't something that my non-economic brain can handle with any uh, particular intelligence other than to say that that's a moral judgment in each different context of what is thought to be fair um, and what isn't. And my gut reaction would be to say that this is as much about um, getting some people to live with less. Uh, taxing those that are wealthy, but also encouraging the reduction in demand from those social groups, um, as it is about elevating the standards of others. Um, and I think that also does link, I'm going to jump in because I really like the question as well, on, to Liz's um, thoughts on whether this phrase is actually all that helpful, the just transition or energy justice, perhaps, in saying that 
this kind of structural inequality that we're referring to that is manifested through energy justice issues, none of it's nice to talk about. <laughs> um, and I once had a conversation with someone in Bayes about the fact that they like fuel poverty as a term because it's easy to define, whereas they wouldn't be interested in justice because it's too woolly. So whilst we may, may be united again by principles or guidelines, um, what language we use in each of those different settings, be it tax or policy, might be subtly different, even if they're guided by the same ambition, so that we can all work towards a greater goal, but in a way that people will actually be willing to listen to. Thank you. Um, plus, I think you've also partly addressed Richard Harper's question about whether just in, justice means everybody gets the same outcome or, or something else. But I don't know if you wanted to comment on that before we move to Sarah. Yeah, I definitely don't think it would necessarily mean that everyone could get the same outcome. If the classic example, which I would give to any kind of first year student, there, there are things that are fundamentally unequal that we cannot change. The distributional pattern of um, wind turbines and therefore who has to be exposed to them isn't something that we can equalize across society. It's definitely, you know, overly going to burden people at the top of a hill. Um, so whilst there are aspects that we could control to a greater extent, perhaps around procedure, um, and how we go about fair decision making. No, I think we have to come to terms with the fact that the world's a very unequal place in other regards. Thank you. And I'd just add another example. Um, larger families living in, in worse uh, accommodation are going to need more carbon to keep warm than uh, people in more in better quality accommodation, for example. So it's a complicated question. So um, carbon allowance is, is perhaps the subject of another seminar. It would be worth maybe thinking through on another occasion. Thanks for the question. Sarah, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, and I won't have too much to say about this because I'll defer to, to, to folks who are smarter in these areas. But I, I mean, I do think that the kind of, I I've always liked the phrase just transition, I have to say, in, in the same way that I kind of, the, the carbon budgeting scares me a bit in that I mean, one of the problems that we always face, I think, in political organization around climate change is there's there's so much of a kind of tendency to fear and negative affect and and you know things that we don't want. Um, and what I like about justice is it opens up lots of language about imagining different kinds of futures and thinking about different kinds of abundance, um, you know, that are radically different. And so I find it really inspirational. Um, and you know. Yeah, you know, for all those ways, but I'll, I'll I'll take that to other people. I do want to talk about taxes because I think they're great. I mean, in all kinds of ways, but um, but I think Mira's question's really good. Um, but there's also all these kind of hidden questions within that one question, and so the question of is it the regulator or the utility? Well, I mean, what about the fossil fuel majors within that too? I mean, so there's there's different kind of corporate interests that we might think about there in big investor interests as well. So there's a lot of folks with skin in the game of, of a transition that stand to lose out from, you know, the death of oil and gas, obviously, and who bears the social pain of that um, isn't always necessarily the taxpayer or the bill payer. That depends on how that's socially and politically regulated, obviously. And, you know, I think it's one of the really interesting developments around some of the kind of new lawsuits around oil and gas is that, you know, there might be exactions on companies that have, you know, persisted in the face of, you know, very good knowledge about the effects of, of ongoing fossil fuel production. So I'm not that hurt by them bearing more of the cost of this. Um, but I think there is a really interesting deeper question around tax paying and bill paying because I think it is important in that I think a lot of what what um, I look at on the ground actually in US uh, renewable energy policy is specific uh, policy uh, instruments like tax subsidies and how they work in practice and you know a really interesting question there is the, the kind of hidden inefficiencies of the way that tax subsidies, for example, in the US work. Um, you know, so for example, a lot of the way they work now is that uh, because of some very specific ways and how those policies are written, um, it ends up being a giveaway in a lot of tax avoidance by very large investment banks and, and kind of Wall Street banks. So there's a lot of skimming off the costs of actual, you know, large scale renewable energy development by actors that we don't necessarily want getting taxpayer dollars. So I think there's um, a lot of kind of how questions that end up mattering, you know, to the tune of trillions of dollars, perhaps. I mean, at this point, it's like billions, but that's enough, right? And so it does matter in how some of these policies are actually designed. 
Uh, but one of the more interesting nitty gritty questions I think that we actually really do have to take on as justice oriented scholars is that we do have to have an eye for the details sometimes before we kind of assume that we all have to make do with less. Thank you. I'm going to hand on to Jess and then before we take Raphael, I'm going to ask Petra and Minerot for a question. So Jess. Thanks. Yeah, I just wanted to take up the question around the term just transition and just throw up, you know, another kind of term, right, that we might think about in comparison is the Green New Deal. And I think that here we, by maybe thinking about these terms together, we can also see some of the tensions and problems with, you know, any kind of term, right? There's no kind of perfect term, I think, that captures everyone's um, imaginations or excitements. And I think we can think about a term like the Green New Deal, which has been like, you know, has been taken up probably more than just transition in lots of contexts, or at least in the US context. But again, it's in the US context, right? The Green New Deal is a term that refers to a particular historical moment in of the New Deal, right, in, in um, American history. And that is part of what it, what gives it its recognition and its you know, power for a lot of people, but it also makes it illegible to, or kind of irrelevant to other people. Um, and it also kind of has, you know, was not a, no policy is perfect, you know, the, the New Deal is not perfect. And so it also has kind of some legacies there. So I think that, you know, I think that in a lot of cases, maybe it's down to contextual work, right? And about the kind of language or terms that um, inspire or excite certain populations rather than a kind of, uh, you know, to a term that works everywhere for everyone. Um, and it's also about thinking through these kind of the cultural and historical legacies um, that we want to connect these causes to, you know, because of course they are connected to them, um, you know, that we want to point out these connections to. Um, so yeah, I'll just kind of use the, use the term uh, Green New Deal as a way of thinking about some of these, what's at stake in, in these names. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, justice is a great term, but it's uh, unfortunate that just transition, as you say, is not always, doesn't always excite people as much as it could. Um, Petra, we're going to take your question next and then hand over to Raphael. Thank you very much, Simone, and congratulations uh, on this uh, interesting panel. And thank you all very much for your contributions. Um, I'm not so sure I've got a question. Uh, it's maybe more an observation and one remark on the uh, carbon budget, actually. Uh, so the first point is, I think this whole discussion probably needs to be uh, phrased or contextualized because what we are missing out is really the Global South perspective. Uh, this discussion is, is something that is quite typical for the Global North and we are not really taking into account that it's not uh, a discussion that is to be had in the Global South, at least not to the same extent. So I work with several countries um, uh, in the South and uh, it, it simply doesn't play a role for them. I mean, they if at all they are looking into uh, changing on or reinvesting into different energy uh, sources but you know they, they're also still looking into adding to the fossil fuel infrastructure um, and i think it's it's even more difficult to convince them to even take part in this discussion if we have the combo uh, oil field as you know off the shetland coast and and so we are investing into more fossil fuels ourselves in the global north so how can we convince the global south to participate in a just transition discussion so i think there's some um, yeah, some rephrasing or reframing of this discussion is quite important. Um, I, I don't have a problem with the, with the term as such, but I think we need to be aware that there are different contexts uh, in which these discussions are taking place. And the other aspect is um, the carbon budget. And I can fully understand, Sarah, what you said about this uh, can be quite a difficult term uh, to, to get the head around. But in law, I think at least it gives us something to handle with and, and to work with in a litigation situation. and. To, for example, in uh, in Germany, the, uh, the Constitutional Court has found that based on the IPCC calculations of the global carbon budgets, then the National uh, Advisory Council could figure out a national rest carbon budget, and on that basis, then could conclude that the current emission amounts that are still allowed under 2030 will demand even higher or even deeper cuts after 2030. And that then that the Constitutional Court uh, to the conclusion that this will lead to an advanced interference like effect with fundamental rights. 
which is then the result that the um, climate protection law or the determinations that are included in the law are unconstitutional. So that was all really based, you know, the, so the entire judicial reasoning starts with the global carbon budget and the calculations that we can only have, um, I think, uh, seven around seven gigatons uh, to reach 1.5 degree um, from that country's perspective alone presuming that everyone, of course, is doing their own fair share as well. Uh, so uh, I, as you know, an, uh, it's, it's not an ideal term. Again, the carbon budget or, or the whole calculations are uh, full of uncertainties as well, but at least it um, can increase the likelihood that the court will find based on these calculations um, that a country needs to be more ambitious. So um, yeah, I just wanted to add that. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Petra. Excellent comments. Uh, Raphael, let me hand over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, I'll just give a few quick thoughts on some of the issues discussed recently. Um, so the first is that, you know, when we talk about justice, we do have a goal in mind. And that's why, uh, you know, Petra mentioned an issue there in the German courts. I mentioned an issue in the Australian courts. You know, the, the role of the court is to protect whatever justice you have in society. The majority of countries in the world have operating courts. So there is a goal from justice. The majority of countries in the world have signed up to the U United Nations. So we all understand you know, basic principles of justice. And I think, um, let's say, when we think about this, you know, what we are talking about, I think, as uh, one or two of the other speakers referred to it, about energy technology, the technology coming down. And maybe for me, I think part of the reason the just transition may not capture people's attention is because they're tired from hearing about oil, gas and coal. And they're tired maybe of people defining a just transition about being oil, gas and coal, because we're thinking, you know, this is old world technology. If I if I said to you today, you know, here we are as a global community we've we've brought in all these vaccines and if i said to you will you take a vaccine we created back in the 1950s for covid you would turn around and say i don't think so you must be having a laugh but yet we are still talking about coal largely we haven't changed the technology for nearly 200 years you know we still burn it the same way still have co2 emissions and it's about time you know we did something about it so i, th I think there's a role of technology uh, that we have to consider. And I think for me, that may make just transition unatt unattractive as a term. But I do think there is a lot of uh, attraction. I mean, we can't always, we, we are dealing with reality. We can't always have a great uh, marketing team, such as the German government who had the energy Vinde policy, which essentially has resulted nearly in increased coal. Uh, you know, so, you know, we need to balance out what we can do as a global community. And what I would say is, think about the success in bringing in new vaccines as a global community. We really should be able to do it in energy technology. And I would echo, I think Sarah made the point earlier, the technology is there. The problem is policymakers, researchers, and everyone slowing down essentially the system of get rolling out that technology fast. And I wonder if we did the same as the vaccine, could we achieve our Paris commitments? Thank you. Um, I think I might not be the only person, I mean, I very much of my sentiments, but I'm a bit concerned about the parallel with uh, the vaccine because as Petra pointed out, we haven't done very well globally in distributing it the, in, an, in an even manner. So let's hope we can do better with uh, clean energy technologies than we've so far managed with the vaccine. But in terms of getting things out there quickly, we know it can be done, uh, but we know there are vested interests who don't want it to happen. And um, there's been recent coverage, as I'm sure you're aware of, some of the tactics used by the big oil uh, multinationals in avoiding the consequences of uh, uh, what climate change would mean for the industry uh, that's being increasingly brought out into the open. Um, Sarah mentioned the um, suits going through the, the, the courts in the United States. We need to start drawing to a close but Kirsten I'll give you uh, an opportunity to, <laughs> to have a word seeing as your hand is raised. Thank you. 
Raphael looks nervous. It's not a direct comment to him this time. Um, yeah, it was it was very much on that um, that point around kind of global community and we and we've used we I think probably very uncritically throughout um, across the panel for all of us as a point of reflection, especially in this context that Petra mentions around the global south and I know of kind of discussions in the energy justice literature where a solution has been proposed perhaps that has a degree of diesel generation and that sparked a lot of debate as to whether that was the most appropriate thing um and there was a bit of back and forward on that and now Raphael should feel nervous um but i think you know there are lots of <laughs> loads and loads of points of like that where you know who are we to be writing in the setting what is right and wrong and it's that is one of these issues of recognition and representation um and an opportunity for cop perhaps where we do have these kind of debates and negotiations um on a, in a more collective sense um and so that's where i think lining this up with kind of what the trajectory of the the event was looking at we really need to make sure that we as a community of scholars are contributing um, to that type of event and also that that type of event is challenged as much as possible for the recognition um, aspect that it does or does not achieve. Thank you. I think that's an excellent point to end on. And just to say, Fiona, I really appreciate your comment and I'm, I'm fairly sure we probably agree with you. I shouldn't speak on behalf of others, but I haven't seen anyone disagreeing with you. Um, thank you very much indeed. I'm just going to hand over to John now just to uh, thank the speakers wholeheartedly. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, looking forward to getting a version of this online and it will link into other uh, events and uh, John will just brief us on what those events are going to be. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much indeed, Simone. Uh, particularly thank you to you for bringing together these uh, four speakers today. So. Sarah, Jess, uh, Kirsten and Raphael, uh, my sincere thanks for uh, performing here today and providing not just an informative but also a lively and en entertaining debate. Thank you too for the other uh, people who chipped in with questions or, or appeared in terms of uh, making statements uh, and that sort of gives a segue if you will to um, the next series. So what we've been doing with the COP26 uh, run-in, at least as far as these uh, events concerned, is uh, different entities within the university have owned a different month. As Simon said at the beginning, we own June for the Energy Institute, following on from the Institute of Hazards and Risk Resilience. Slight change in September, uh, where uh, the legal department, uh, and Petra in particular, will be running a two-day session uh, on the 15th and 16th of September covering adaption and resilience uh, in, the, in the light of COP26. And then we'll run on through September and October uh, with more events. It's not all we're doing for COP26, and particularly from an energy perspective, if you want to take a look at the website, the DEI website, subset of the university one you'll see a number of uh, other things so uh, i guess for the time being have a lovely summer and uh, we'll see you in a couple of months time thank you bye-bye <laughs>